So, um, yeah, my talk is not going to be so much about technology because the technology I use is actually very simple and um, relies at the end of it. So you can think about that. It's mainly headphones. It's headphones with wireless transmission, which you can see in any opera production and TV studio. Pretty common technology. What I'm going to talk about is something else. It's a kind of um, compositional approach that I've been taking over the last 20 years or so, um, and that I never really thought about until recently. Uh, just did it, and uh, now I'm trying to formalize it in some way and find a kind of idea behind it. So the original idea came from this situation that we all know. Um, when we when you want a, a sound to be in a particular way, what musicians do to make other musicians make that sound, and that's a little bit what Jonathan also does, is to play music to them. So that's music is the best example for sound. Right? We, have, we are all about notation and not, notating sound, but if a teacher, a music teacher, wants the student to have a particular sound, a particular inflection, a particular way of playing, they play music to them. Um, if a conductor, wants the orchestra to play in a certain way, they sing to them. Even that's, that's bad singing, but it's better than explaining it in words. So this kind of um, uh, idea was sort of the departure point for my score, um, my scores. So we've had, of course, visual scores, and we all know what they are. And they have been the dominant channel for music conveyance over many centuries now. They translate, basically, they always try to translate music in actions and or music in sounds into some kind of a visual language. And as usually always relied on additional information, like verbal information or oral tradition or just sonic information that is supplied in some other way. And it certainly not, doesn't, um, uh, replace other modes of music conveyance, um, as we all know. Um, <clears throat> most of the other elements that are conveyed are actually conveyed by the ear, quantitatively, even in traditional practice. So um, um, the finer points are by the ear, the, the, the notation is for the general outline, for the general outline. Um, not most, so most conductors sing. I said that you know that Barbara Hannigan sings while she conducts. Well, that's not the case that I mean. But she's a very good conductor and singer. In many traditions, actually, a lot of the tasks that have been done by conductors have been done by auditory cues. And so you see uh, gamelan orchestra or West African drumming or even tabla. Um, I'll skip all the video images because I want to get to the lecture in time, but um, you know in tabla you have the tabla bowls which a tabla player uh, speaks and um, they can actually convey a lot more than just uh, a written notation and so Indian tradition has tended to stay with the oral notation although they have developed several systems of writing music, the oral notation seems to be the best adapted to this. Oral in both senses, ear and mouth. Um, there is a tradition of using metronomes and click tracks. Um, and uh, we've, we know of them. Click tracks are mainly for student practice or for coordinating fixed media um, compositions with, with um, live musicians. So that has, that's a common practice. And the metronome by itself is not really a device, uh, an artistic device. Mm -hmm. It's rather an or orientation, just like the click track. Click tracks also, of course, and I've used it in several pieces, can uh, guide an ensemble through independent polyphonic evolutions of tempo. And that's also a very important device uh, used there. And then that it becomes compositional, so it's the first audio score <coughs> in my sense. And so these kind of click tracks that are used to create complex layers of tempo. So what is the elaborate audio score? Um, for me, it's a score that basically uses uh, headphones as the score interface. And all musical information is primarily conveyed as auditory communication. So there's no written score at all. Um, 
the information is conveyed in the real time of the performance. And um, you have many highly differentiated modes of conveyance, which are then um, uh, 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 enlarged on. And you can use this in a situational way, meaning that the score is created at the moment of listening, more or less. Or you can use it in a fixed way, where the score is already, it's kind of like, like a fixed audio composition and played back to the musicians. Um, so why should I use this? Uh, because I, my interest was to precisely shape musical sound, to give precise emotional and, and sonic examples to the musician. And uh, when you play music or sounds to a musician in, in order to make them do something, um, the mediation is very minimal. So it's only the mediation through our ear and our own sensibility and our prowess on our instruments. That, that counts. Um, and another important point for me was that the musicians are suddenly free to use their eyes for orientation and thus can move around in space. Um, of course, if they have wireless headphones. Um, and also um, using uh, audio scores, and that's something that Jonathan also mentioned, can reduce rehearsal time considerably for complex things that you want them to do, which when written, demand an equally complex process of assimilation, whereas when they're actually just proposed as a sound, can um, be absorbed much more quickly by a musician. Um, in my practice, I've been doing this, actually I discovered that one of the very first piece that I wrote as a music student in 85, um, the very first finished piece was for three blindfolded musicians with headphones. Um, it was never performed. Um, my idea at that point was that the three musicians would have their part, their written parts, but the music that they played, so the other musicians that they played with, um, would be on their headphones and not in the real space. So it would be for um, a trio of three people that are not in the same, same acoustic, emotional, musical space. And how would that sound? For obvious reasons, at the beginning of a uh, composition study, uh, you don't have the resources nor the clout to make something like that happen, so it didn't happen. Um, and I actually don't know what the score of this piece is. But this is the, showed a little the interest of my work from the very start. And I've since, in various stages, I'm not going to comment on all these pieces, um, written uh, uh, or created several types of audio scores. Some of them still with notation, others without with written notation, others without notation, some of them with rule systems that musicians had to learn, others with, with uh, 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 material that musicians had to learn beforehand and so on that could be uh, used in the score. Um, you will see on Friday, you will see the first performance of the Silence of Absence, um, a new piece where I use the body suit, which is another technology I'm not going to discuss here, but I think this is something that I'm working on too, a, a body suit score and an audio score. The body suit score, in this case, is actually f to influence the musicians through the audience, so the audience can, through cell phones and interfaces, can control the musicians playing, but all the playing instructions or the score are sent through the audio score. Um, so the idea was to have a kind of circulatory <coughs> concert. That's one of my um, uh, research interests. To have concerts where the audience moves and the musicians move. And spatialization is something that is, in a way, interactive. Um, you can determine your specialization, but then the specialization itself can move and, um, through moving musicians. Here's a slight Gariniac example. This we did without anyone knowing that it was a concert.
frage ich, was ihr mögt. acknowledge the um, anticipatory plagiarists. It's a nice term that the William Poe writers coined <laughs> for everybody who did work that was similar to this before they invented it. Um, so um, the thing is that I did not know this. I, I developed this by myself and um, then later on looked up people who might have done, uh, might have been precursors. So it is actually some kind of anticipatory <coughs> Except for Jérôme Lebel, the show must go on, which is so, a show that deeply impressed me and brought to the four ideas that I had as a dance show, where every singer, every dancer has their own headphone and acts accordingly differently in this case. So the modes of conveyance. So we have five modes of conveyance in a score. Uh, information, instruction, imitation, and inspiration. And I'll quickly go through them. These are the different kinds of commands, so to speak of the different kind of uses that um, a composer can uh, can put into a score and, and use for instructing musicians. So information cues are very simple. There are cues where the musician should know what to do. For example, start section two now. So the musician would be informed about what section two means, and they can start it now. So that's purely informational. Um, like pitch cues too. Um, so a pitch cue is an informational cue. You're supposed to know what to do with that pitch. There's no extra information attached to that. You're supposed to somehow realize it or do something else. Um, then you have musical instructions. You can recall previously recorded um, elements or memorized elements. You can adapt memorized music to the current context. For example, say um, you have memorized a, a, a melodic structure and now you say, but it's in a new rhythm or it's in a new context or please transpose it to the current uh, tonality or whatever. You can create music that fits a given but vague poetic information. Make sad music, for example. Mm -hmm. Then musicians call to, run to create something sad. Um, you can tune the music to the pitch you hear. For example, you say uh, you're improvising and then suddenly a pitch appears and then you can tune the music to that pitch. Or can use the audio score as a conductor, which is the click track phenomenon, but in a more elaborate way, you can have many kinds of different coordination elements that um, coordinate musicians. You heard at some point that they suddenly had a, a clear chord in the midst of their vo voices, of bird voices, and that was, of course, um, counted in, whereas a lot of the parts before were very elastic in the time structure. Um, interaction instructions can ask the, the performer to interact with other musicians. For example, you saw them chasing each other. That was one interaction that was actually in the score. They should go towards <coughs> one of the other uh, singers. Um, any kind of interaction can be written in there. And it's a kind of a social score in that sense. The social behavior of the musicians is called upon here. Um, or you could even interact with something that's beyond the control of the composer that happens in the contingent moment of the performance, <coughs> like street noises. We had beautiful um, uh, fire uh, trucks passing by uh, just now, so you could react to that. Um, 
Higher musical instructions are mus instructions that relate to the music, but really not to the music making as such, not to the sound production, but to the body posture, for example, crouch down, play, play uh, running, or um, look at in a certain direction, which in some instruments will create a directional sound. So all these kind of things can be um, uh, in these instructions, also non-sonic instructions like a costume change that might impact something. So that's a very important factor. And in lexical instructions set up other modes where they say the following mode for the following sound that you hear is to be used for inspiration and instance or instruction or imitation. So in imitation music, musicians are asked to imitate a sound, just imitate the sound. Um, that is sometimes impossible if you have a very complex sound and you have a very limited instrument and then you try to imitate it and then try to imitate a complex sound will create very interesting sound. Um, and it also allows for a tradition and instrument agnostic approach to this. You could transfer this from one instrument, instrument to another. Each instrument tries to make the same sound, doesn't succeed, and fails better, as Beckett would have said. Um, inspiration is a different kind of approach. Musicians are respond to a sound in very definable ways, accentuated, ornamented. Um, in, in effect, it's kind of a social reaction to a sound. You act towards the sound like you would act to another person in a certain way. And the, certain, the, the third um, sound relation is a sound music example is taken exi as exactly that, an example of a style. So you play a short, very simple, you play a short bebop example, and then, then uh, the person should play bebop music in that kind of, in that kind of moment. Um, only that it's not bebop, it's a specific composition that you can make beforehand in a specific style, and that style needs to be imitated. So mimicry, elaboration, and analysis, and reconstruction. So in these two, um, in these five different ways of using commands or examples, you can create a whole lot of combinations and very <coughs> differentiated approaches to making musicians do uh, uh, work in different ways. Sometimes you want them to be exactly imitating the sound, sometimes you want them to be um, very uh, free or you want to inspire them to do something. So all kinds of distances are possible. Um, I always differentiate between two approaches to, to making music. One is the tradition and composition part, where you sort of define, assume a stable relationship between what you have composed and what the context gives you. The context is sort of assumed in many um, situations and it becomes invisible to your practice. It's just there. String quartet is just there. Um, it doesn't mean anything that they're for string quartet players. That's the string quartet. Um, whereas in composition, none of these relationships are at all assumed. It's, it's always something that you have to define when you create a composition. How the different parts, is notation important or not? Is is the placement important or not? You have to define each parameter of the music um, from scratch, basically, and define how you want to treat it. And this treatment informs the aesthetical dimension of the score, so it's very important artistically. And of course, um, as there is no accepted tradition of how to perform audio scores, they currently are all compromisations because they have to define your relationship to the music at the same time. Um, I think I'm running out of time. I'm just quickly skip through the next issue. That's a question of timing, because you get a command as a musician, you need to react. But you may be just doing something that you want to finish, you don't want to stop. Um, so timing in, in uh, audio scores is something that I call heterophonic elastic timing. Everybody knows elastic timing from, from live performance, that's which has usually elastic timing. Um, um, and um, in audio scores, usually what happens is that everybody is somehow together because the audio score coordinates them, but not exactly, but also not in any time-shifted way. It's more like this, where the, the, the relationship between synchronicity and uh, non-synchronicity may vary on each beat, so to speak, or on each event. And um, so it's a new kind, I, I try to find old terms for it, like 
rubato's ring or inner timing, but they don't work for this kind of situation. It's really more like swimming in a swarm for, or flying in a swarm for birds, where everybody goes for the same goal, but not in this exactly the same way. That's a kind of coordination. Um, and then at the end, it's just, um, I found that in rehearsal preparation time, the elaborate audio score is somewhat between chamber music and orchestra preparation. It's a little less time consuming than the chamber music presentation, but a little more time consuming than orchestra, um, because orchestras don't rehearse that much for one piece. So the ideal setup is this, very simple. Um, and uh, because of the elastic time, I could still imagine this, this kind of on the web synchronization, we haven't done it. For audio yet, we're doing it for um, just command signals uh, structures. So that's what's going to you might want people to react to each other in a socially different way than musicians, or to react to the audience in a different way. So these kind of relationships have to be defined, and they cannot be standard instructions. And I think because you're making them up any time, every time anyway, there's no point in even, for me at least, there's no point in creating a standard repertoire of questions beyond this classification, because this classification, I think, covers everything. If, and then you combine different, you can layer these classifications there. They're not hierarchically ordered, they're all on the same level, and you can then layer the hierarchies that you find interesting. Another question? Um, I know that sometimes um, jazz musicians uh, criticize classical music musicians saying, the score is sort of a barrier that that is between the performer and the audience. So do you think it this of the, the same with audio scores? Do do they do they separate the, the, the performer from the audience or did they put them in a bubble or something? Do they isolate them? Um, no. In, in fact because the performers can interact directly with the audience in a in a physical way and in a direct personal way, um, they do tend to not do that. I mean, if, of course, if they would have both ears closed, it would be mm. not so ideal. I did the piece with that where they had to have both ears covered, and the point was that you don't communicate with your, so it was a take on the Walkman generation or some other, on the iPod generation. But in other cases, no. Um, uh, I find that actually there's a much direct, much more direct contact with the audience because there's nothing, no encumbrances at all no music stand, and also no set formation you can do all that. Okay. So, last question. Uh, is there anything uh, decided before the execution? Because uh, I was thinking a situation I would like, like uh, is not this situation, but uh, there is a conductor. Mm -hmm. It is uh, like a spread from the public, and it's like an improviser. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an uh, improvisation where he select the people who want to say something, but he felt that they didn't have time. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I don't know if you try this sort of situation where the piece of music is not decided in advance, but uh, the conductor is making the music, like an uh, uh, improviser performance, something like that. Yeah, that's uh, all possible. I mean, in the piece that you're going to hear on Friday, there's a um, uh, score, the audio score is actually live generated okay. by, by an algorithmic um, software. Okay. And no one, the musicians don't know, we don't, we don't know what they're hearing. Um, and that's <coughs> part of the aesthetic setup of this, that we have no idea what they're reacting to. 
um, and that we as an audience can interact with them too, and we also don't know what they will do with our interactions. Um, but we'll, um, we can see that, and, and at least in rehearsals we saw it, um, that it's very clear that they react to input, but they're also their own musicians. They can, do, they can play things they want like to play too. So, um, uh, again, this is, this is just a classification of of possible commands, how you <coughs> generate those commands, in what way is absolutely open. So, thanks again. Thank you.